tonight on CBC Vancouver News. So this is, I believe, the end of our beginning of this pandemic. Ready to reopen how BC can contain COVID-19 while allowing your social interactions to double in the coming weeks. Also, losing your children has just got to be one of the worst things ever. Two children are killed in a UTV accident in the Fraser Valley and... They are very defensive. They will come out and they will start stinging. What's the buzz? BC braces for the so-called murder hornet. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. The end of our beginning. BC's top doctor again quoting Churchill today, but unlike last month, to say we are now there at the end of our beginning in the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Bonnie Henry presented updated modeling revealing why and how our province can start to loosen some restrictions without sending case levels soaring. Tanya Fletcher is here live. And Tanya, the province has landed on a target range for personal interactions and it's double what we're currently doing? Yeah, that's right, Anita. It's the sweet spot BC is aiming for to get as close to that line, as back to normal as we can without actually crossing it. Now, I want to illustrate how that could look with the new models. Take a look at the latest projections here today. This is key. This shows that if we went back to 100% the way we were, this red line here, look at how critical care cases will suddenly surge. And even at only 80%, that's this pink line here, if we went back to 80% to normal, we'd still see a significant spike in those cases accelerate quite quickly. Right now though, where we're at is currently way down here, the purple line. We're at about 30, 35% of normal interactions at the moment with our current measures. The orange line slightly above is key. We could double the 30% down here to about 60% and still keep that line relatively flat as you can see. So this is the goal and Dr. Bonnie Henry outlines what that could look like when it comes to the retail sector. So it's uh, still having the online, uh, the, the sort of mixture of online and in, in store experience, if you will, reducing the numbers of people that can be in a store at a period of time, making sure that we have um, hand hygiene uh, available for people. How can we uh, uh, lift the restrictions on restaurants and pubs within that uh, framework? But she cautions we're not there yet in being able to expand our personal interactions. We're still hovering kind of at that tipping point, trying to contain various outbreaks and trying with community cases that are still incubating not to see those transmit as well. Okay, and Tanya, the, the province is also highlighting the most effective and least effective measures in trying to contain the spread, what are those? Yeah, Mike, one of the slides from today's epidemiological modeling was an inverted pyramid illustrating just that. Take a look at it here. So you can see it has physical distancing at the top and being the most effective. Next is engineering control. That's things like those plexiglass barriers we're starting to see in the grocery stores now. Below that, administrative controls. That's similar things like putting the tape on the ground to mark two meter spaces between people. And at the very bottom, you see PPE, personal protective equipment, like like those homemade masks, they're suggesting that uh, they're the least effective way to reduce transmission. And so why the physical distancing is so important? Well, Dr. Henry says reconnecting with even one additional person outside our current household bubble can lead to exponential spread. When you invite one person outside of your immediate household bubble into your home, you're also inviting all of the people in their bubble, the people that they've had contact with. And that includes people from their work, from their home and others that they've had close contact with. So these are these physical distancing and how we manage those in the coming months is going to be really important. And now the BC government will take the latest modeling projections that we saw today to finalize its reopening plan in the next few days. And Premier John Horgan is expected to outline that rollout come Wednesday. Well, Mike, Anita. We'll look forward to that. Thanks, Tanya. Tanya Fletcher reporting live tonight. And health officials also gave the latest stats on COVID-19 in BC. Now keep in mind these numbers are from the past two days. There were three new deaths in our province, bringing the total to 117. 53 new cases were announced with the number of total confirmed cases in BC now standing at 2,224. There are 77 people now in hospital, 20 of them in intensive care. And just over 1,400 people have now fully recovered from the virus.
Lots to discuss here as the province released its latest modeling. So we are once again taking your questions and putting them to our expert tonight. Later this hour, we are welcoming back Dr. Murthy. Call us now at 604-662-6801 or email us at cbcnewsvancouver at cbc.ca. If you are watching online, you can post your questions in the comment section. A tragic accident to tell you about tonight. Two children are dead after the UTV they were riding on went into the water at Foley Lake near Chilliwack. Tina Lovegreen has more on how it happened and the heroic efforts to try to save their lives. It was supposed to be a day of fun and recreation for an Abbotsford family of five. They were out here in Chilliwack on a UTV, but it ended tragically when that vehicle lost control and went down an embankment, killing a nine-year-old girl and 10-year-old boy. Despite their best efforts, rescuers were unable to save the two children, forcing the RCMP dive team to go in to recover the bodies from the frigid and murky waters. The parents and their other child managed to escape. They were pretty upset. I mean, losing your children has just got to be one of the worst things ever. So you're right there. So. 43 years, Dan McAuliffe has been with Chilliwack Search and Rescue. Yesterday was one day he'll never forget. He and his team used their own UTV to get to the site, navigating the very challenging road. It was at least, it was about 200 feet down to the water, really steep slope, and then the UTV ended up about 30 feet off the shore in the water. So it must have tumbled. There were pieces of the UTV, the windshield and that, so it must have tumbled on the way down. And it's amazing that, you know, people did survive it all. All five family members were wearing seat belts and helmets. The RCMP says the three who survived were helped by the heroic efforts of people nearby. One of the individuals was in a pontoon boat on the lake and he actually witnessed the vehicle coming over the embankment. Um, again, he immediately attended the scene of where the vehicle was submerged and dove into the water. There was a young lady up there, I believe her name was Joy, and she ran, she ran down this really steep slope, jumped in the water, swam out and got down far enough that she could touch the wheel of the UTV but couldn't get any further. And Others alerted first responders to the scene. Anybody who can't even begin to imagine this unthinkable tragedy this family is going through. The BC Corner Service is investigating, but rescuers who were on the ground yesterday tell us that the weather may have been a factor, that that area where the UTV slid off was washed out. And as you can see, there are large ditches and potholes on this road filled with water, indicating that that may have played a role in this accident. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Chilliwack. Well, some families are upset with BC Hydro, saying they've been unfairly rejected for financial aid. The utility is offering three months of bill relief for certain customers, but as Leanne Young reports, those who haven't qualified may be able to in the future. When Whistler's Lori Cooper and her husband heard BC Hydro was offering help with their bills, she quickly applied. Then days later found out she was rejected. We don't have a big house. We don't have a swimming pool. We don't have, you know, anything that's consuming a lot of electricity. We're just like four people living in a house. So I, I just assumed that we would qualify. Cooper and her husband both lost their hospitality jobs because of COVID-19, but they weren't eligible because they use more than the cutoff limit. Your average monthly electricity consumption can't exceed 2,500 kilowatts an hour. But the reality is when you live in a cold place and if your only source of heat is electric, I think it's impossible to keep it under 2,500 kilowatt hours. Last month, they used 3,300, already relying on their wood fireplace as much as possible. Natural gas isn't an option in her subdivision. She's not the only one. So we have a lot of windows, um, the whole back of the house is windows. Claire Riley and her family are trying to keep the heat in and the lights on after she lost work as an interior designer. We're just moving money around trying to survive, like just floating, you know, treading water is sort of what we're, what we're doing. Their four bedroom home costs around $1,000 a month to heat, using close to 7,400 kilowatts yeah. per hour last month, but she's not looking for a write off. What we're asking for is just everyone to be equal and just to have maybe have a cap, maybe have 
you know, a maximum amount that each family is going to be gifted or to have a subsidy to help with the bills. BC Hydro says the average residential customer uses around 900 kilowatts per hour a month. It notifies authorities when homes consistently hit above 2,500 over concerns of illegal activity. But the company is now reconsidering that threshold to help more people. We do know about 2% of our customers do fall into this category. Um, so we are looking at, at options, whether we need to adjust that 2500 threshold to to meet these customers needs to ensure those that are that need the help are able to get it. There's no timeline yet on when that adjustment could come. If and when it does, customers will have until June 30th to reapply. Of the 110,000 households that have applied, the majority are expected to be approved. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, people who ride the bus will once again have to pay a fare starting next month. That's the word from TransLink tonight, which says it's also stepping up efforts to keep bus drivers safe during the pandemic. Temporary barriers between the driver and passengers are being added to all buses by June 1st. That's also the date fare collection restarts, with riders entering via the front doors again. TransLink expects the move to recoup about $2 million a month. The company is facing reported financial losses of around $75 million a month as it provides essential services during the COVID-19 outbreak. Home sales in the Lower Mainland dropped last month following the beginning of the pandemic. However, there was nearly no change in sale prices. Both the Greater Vancouver and Fraser Valley Real Estate Board saw more than 50% drops in sales from March to April. However, the benchmark price for both regions barely changed. In fact, each went up less than a percent. Realtors have been named an essential service by the provincial government. In order to meet demand, more transactions are being done electronically and open houses are being live streamed to interested buyers. Well, it's kind of like a scary science fiction plot. Murderous flying bugs that can attack and kill humans. But as Greg Rasmussen found out, they do exist and they've made it to BC. It's one scary bug. They have a very formidable stinging apparatus uh, and they can inject quite a bit of venom. Shown here next to a Canadian wasp, they originate in Asia where they're nicknamed the murder hornet for swarming and killing people. There have been uh, significant uh, uh, annual casualties as a result of this, uh, of this defensive behavior of these hornets. Uh, you're talking about a few dozen people every year, at least in, in, in Japan. Another fear is the impact on already troubled honeybees, which the Asian hornets can quickly decimate. Damage will occur, there's no question, but I think that beekeepers are pretty savvy operators and will deal with them successfully. So far, the giant hornets have been found at two locations in B.C. and more recently in northern Washington state. The nest found on Vancouver Island contained about 200 of the creatures. Beekeeper Conrad Berube was sent to remove it. Oh, that's the queen? <gasps> so. Let me see. Oh, look at her. My reaction was, holy smokes, that's a big wasp. Uh, and they, they are, in fact, the, the largest species of wasp uh, on the planet. But he paid a big price, despite his protective beekeeper suit. The enraged hornets uh, immediately uh, stung me across, uh, uh, across the tops of my thighs. Uh, it was like having uh, red-hot thumbtacks driven into one's flesh. Um, and uh, not everybody is into that. <laughs> so it was, it was quite painful. Not many left, though. He was stung seven times, even through a thick leather glove, and he still has the scars from its powerful venom. The hornets likely arrived on cargo ships, later setting up nests deep in the forest, eluding efforts to find them. At this point in time, really what you call the, the needle in a haystack. It is, this is really tough. But tracking them is important before more emerge and reproduce. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. The union representing RCMP officers says a new poll it commissioned shows Surrey residents don't want to change police forces during the pandemic, at least. The poll done by Polara Strategic Insights said 60% of 803 adults surveyed in mid-April opposed the city's plan to transition to a local police force. 83% said this wasn't the time to do it. And with the pandemic causing a huge budget shortfall for the city, the poll found respondents want the city to have a referendum on the issue.
Well, smoking or smoking materials are being blamed as the cause of one of BC's most destructive wildfires. The BC government released the results of its investigation into the 2017 Elephant Hill wildfire this morning. Everything from lightning to arson were investigated as potential causes. The wildfire broke out near Ashcroft and spread north through the Boston Flats, Loon Lake and Pressy Lake areas. It destroyed more than 120 homes. Although investigators believe smoking or smoking materials caused the fire, no suspect has been identified and the RCMP's case is now closed. Okay, first check of the forecast now. We're joined by meteorologist Brett Soderholm. A little bit of everything today. Well, no precipitation as far as I know, but uh, a lot of cloud and uh, plenty of sunshine as well. <laughs> That's exactly right, and we do have a little bit of that precipitation. It's going to be making its way here over the next couple of hours, but it's not going to be sticking around for too long, probably just until about midnight or so. But yeah, definitely this morning started off fairly bright, and we did have a bit of that cloud cover, and that's going to be largely the trend for tomorrow as well. But I want to start things off by showing you a live look at our satellite and radar coverage at the point. You'll notice right now that a lot of the showers we're seeing are just over the southern portions of Vancouver Island at this point in time, so just making its way over to Victoria and going across and that's going to be taking a couple of hours before it makes its way over here into the lower mainland. Now because we had a lot of cloud cover temperatures didn't really go that much above seasonal today. This is what we got up to. These are actual observations. You can see Hope getting up to 18, the airport YVR getting up to 15 and Squamish up to 17. So a normal temperature for this time of year would be at about 16. So we are bang on where we should be and in terms of where we are at this exact moment a little bit cooler just because of that water influence down at the airport but everywhere else doing not too badly. Now temperatures uh, is going to be one part of our story for tomorrow but I do want to mention we are expecting showers as I said just by about midnight. We'll be clearing up nicely throughout tomorrow and then the showers again are going to be coming back by tomorrow night. So it's really the best of both worlds getting the showers overnight and fairly nice conditions during the day. Hard to complain about that. Yeah, it really is. All right Brett thanks. Talk to you again in a bit. Well their shops may be shuttered. But some business owners in downtown Vancouver are working with local artists to turn a sad sign of the times into signs of hope. Take a look at these before and after shots. Boarded up storefronts in Vancouver transformed from drab to delightful. Local artists are painting the murals, some with messages of support and perseverance. The organizer of the project says it's about helping people stay positive right now drove by some of those uh, earlier today they look uh, they look really good they're pretty incredible yeah. and i think it does provide a little bit of hope and and puts a smile on people's faces in this time so it does all right just a reminder you can watch this newscast live on cbc gem the free app is also where you can find other cbc programs cbc vancouver is also on facebook youtube and instagram and of course you can follow the both of us on twitter and instagram as well after a two-week shutdown, a huge meat processing plant near Calgary reopens. Why some workers say they still don't feel safe. Coming up. Thank you so much for watching us online during the regularly scheduled TV commercial break. Now, universities and colleges are looking for new ways to accommodate students during the pandemic, and some are turning to a Toronto startup for help. Tech Adaptica developed a virtual campus, and as Philippe de Montagnier shows us, it's being used by students of all ages. During the lockdown, Ashley Hansen is taking classes on a virtual campus. It's like a video game. The grade 8 student created her own avatar, and every day she has to meet up with her teacher and classmates. I've just been able to transition so easily and actually learn even better. Than she says the alternative, video conferencing, school, has its like, limits. One of the issues with online learning is you, you're not having as much interaction as you would in normal classes. Since schools and universities moved courses online, many have reached out to the Toronto startup behind this virtual campus. We're getting hundreds of calls from universities and governments from all over the world. Tech Adaptica is trying to tackle a major issue with current e-learning tools, the lack of student engagement. We created the virtual campus because we saw that the current technologies are not really offering um, a great alternative to, real, to the real world. George Brown College helped beta test the technology. It's considering signing up to the virtual campus for its year-end showcase. What's really attractive to us is that uh, the possibility that you could have students uh, sitting beside their work. 
and then being able to welcome people visiting and talk about their work. The interactive platform also allows users to take part in other courses and conferences they might otherwise not have access to at their school. It fills a void, it fills a need of something that we couldn't provide and we would not be able to provide. Instructors and students can log on from pretty much anywhere in the world. So far, 25 school boards across Ontario have signed up, including Toronto Catholic, York Catholic, Dufferin Peel, and both Durham boards. Philippe de Monsigny, CBC News, Toronto. I think a lot of people hope it's just filling a void, as they say, because I mean, look at how much virtual stuff we've, we've got right now. And I, I realize it's probably temporary, but uh, you know whether it's the, the chatting online or these virtual experiences, uh, We've certainly seen a lot of it. Yeah, and it's, I have to say, you know, I know it's a sign of the times and also we're going to see more of it COVID related or not because of technology, but mm -hmm. it's a little bit exhausting. It is. <laughs> it's exhausting. <laughs> All right, in case you missed it, we are once again taking your questions about health and COVID-19 and putting them to our expert. Coming up in about 15 minutes, we'll be talking to Dr. Murthy. Call us now, 604-662-6801, or send us an email, cbcnewsvancouver at cbc.ca. If you are watching online, you can post your questions in the comment section on YouTube or Facebook. Several provinces have now taken the first steps towards reopening some stores and businesses, including the site of the largest COVID-19 outbreak in the country. After a two-week shutdown, some employees returned to work at the Cargill meat processing plant near Calgary. But as Carolyn Den reports, that doesn't mean they all feel safe. Masks, three baskets of information. Just here, do you want one or two? Cargill is open. At least some of its workers are reluctantly back on the job. Nearly half of them, 936, have contracted the coronavirus. One person has died. 80% of them said that they did not want this plant to open and 85% of them said they were scared to come to work. The union has been seeking a stop work order from Alberta's Labour Board to no avail. So with a pregnant wife, Freddie Jose is taking a month's leave before, of absence. Uh, before I go back to work because I'm still a little bit scared because uh, for my baby, right? Cargill says working with provincial labor and health authorities, it has increased the safety at the plant. They've always trusted us and we're just asking them to trust us now. We're working really, really hard to keep our employees safe. Uh, we don't have a playbook for this. We wish we did. This is something that we're learning from. But skepticism among returning employees is high. But I want to see the, the situation. If the situation is not good, it's unsafe, I'm sorry about that. Many of those who are returning are concerned history will repeat itself. Workers had sounded the alarm about unsafe conditions and felt pressure to work anyway. The plant closed temporarily after the death of Hip Wee. Today, her husband publicly mourned his loss through an interpreter. I am so, so sad up to the point that I'm speechless because I know that I uh, will not see my wife anymore. Nan Nguyen says Cargill has not offered its condolences, but he hopes as employees go back to work, Cargill can control the spread of the virus so there won't be any more victims like his wife. Carolyn Dunn, CBC News, High River, Alberta. Federal opposition leader Andrew Scheer is criticizing some of the benefit programs brought in by the Liberal government. He said today the Canada Emergency Response Benefit and the Student Benefit will hurt our economy, that recipients will take the money rather than take a job. At a time when our economy needs stimulus, Justin Trudeau has given it a tranquilizer and risked creating labour shortages across the country. This failure must be reversed before it is too late. Canada's economic recovery depends on it. The Prime Minister countered those criticisms today, saying Canadians still need help. I 
really look forward uh, to facing that challenge of how we start to scale back the benefits and help people uh, get back to work. Um, we're not there yet. We're very much still trying to make sure that people are getting the support they need, uh, even as the economy is starting to gradually reopen. Our focus is on keeping people safe. For now, we're still very much focused on how we help people through this. And the federal government is planning more repatriation flights for Canadians stuck in India during the COVID shutdown. The flights will be running from May 12th to 21st. BC Liberal MP Suk Dhaliwal's office says 13 flights are being arranged. Returning to Vancouver and Toronto with passengers from Amritsar, Delhi and Ahmedabad. That'll bring the total to 37 repatriation flights, bringing Canadians home from around the world. Air Canada says it has lost just over a billion dollars in the first quarter. That's compared with a profit of $345 million in the same quarter last year. The airline says it will likely take three years to recover from what it calls the darkest period in commercial aviation history. As a result, it plans to significantly reduce its number of employees and the size of its fleet. The company is also introducing new safety measures for passengers, including leaving seats empty between passengers until at least the end of June. And the wedding industry is also struggling, May usually marking the beginning of wedding season. But people in the multi-billion dollar sector say 2020 is already a write-off. And as Ali Shiasan reports, that goes for everyone, including one dress designer who's been in the business for almost 40 years. Kim Ironmonger, the owner of Valencian Bridal Shop, remembers the day in March when the wedding bells stopped ringing. So I had 60 brides coming here to view a fashion show. And I was forced to cancel that event. It was the weekend before the province declared a state of emergency. Then, one by one, brides pushed their weddings to 2021. So whenever we get to work, I'm pretty well done for 2020. Work has dried up for a lot of vendors, from florists to photographers. It's definitely going to change the industry, and it's going to... After 30 years know, in the business, Anthony Moneri is expecting the gig to look a lot different. They may only be able to hold something, you know, with 30 people there. That could be half of their family. There is a romantic way of looking at it. A wedding is about two people falling in love. So do you need 500 people there? But how is anybody making any money? If they go the route of taking the loan from the government for their small business, or they would take the CERB. Kim Ironmonger says her landlord isn't giving her much of a break, and she doesn't want to take on a government loan. Well, do I go into my savings? What do I do? She's still designing gowns over video chat. I'm not letting any bride down. That's not at all an op option for me. But she is adding her voice to the cry for more help from the government. It is a, it's in our event industry. We are responsible for an incredible amount of money coming into, uh, into business, into Toronto. And it seems to be, the entire industry seems to be overlooked. And with no firm timeline for when people can gather again, vendors are left wondering if they'll even be in business by the time couples get to say I do. Ali Chiasson, CBC News, Toronto. Well, cities are also having to adapt to a new normal, and that means rethinking outdoor spaces. Mm -hmm. And as Chris Brown explains, it's things like giving people more room to commute, exercise, and even grab a cup of coffee. In the Baltic nation of Lithuania, they're reimagining their capital for a physically distanced world, turning much of Vilnius into a big outdoor cafe, far beyond just putting people on patios, but taking over public spaces. It was uh, just a square, and now we dedicated this square as well uh, for open-air cafes, and uh, I'm pretty sure that it will be full of tables, keeping up the right physical distance as required. Restaurant manager Imantis Lampinkas acknowledges being outdoors won't appeal to all of his customers, but probably just enough to keep his business going. We're keeping the distance between the tables. Uh, staff are wearing the masks and the gloves, using sanitizer, sanitizing the, the tables. 
every single minute. If people are to get extra distance between them, yeah. Vancouver and urban planner West Brent Totterin says reconfiguring park. streets no, to find that extra space will be yes. essential. More space outside on streets and sidewalks. It, the sidewalks won't even be enough. We're going to need to think about closing streets, using lanes, reusing space that uh, has been used for other things. Milan, one of the first big cities in Europe to shut down, is now reconfiguring its roads. Over the summer, it will transform 35 kilometers to give more space for pedestrians and cyclists under a planet called Strata Aperte, or open roads. In North America, Oakland is doing something similar, closing over 100 kilometers of streets, or 10% of the roads in the city. I think that it's wonderful after, uh, well, almost two months be, being locked in, in your apartment to enjoy the sun, coffee. Of course, in places such as Lithuania and Canada, the weather is obviously a huge challenge for outdoor dining, but one week into it, customers seem prepared to bundle up. Chris Brown, CBC News, Vancouver. Coming up next, it's become a very popular segment. We take your COVID-19 questions to the experts. Infectious disease specialist Dr. Srinivas Murthy is back with us live tonight. So give us a call now, the number on your screen, or send us an email. We will be right back. We are back live during our second TV commercial break. Several more provinces have started cautiously easing coronavirus restrictions as everyone tries to adapt to this new normal of the pandemic. And Quebec's premier has decided to back off from plans to allow retail businesses in the greater Montreal area to reopen today. The great majority of hospitalization caused by coronavirus are currently happening in the Montreal region. This is why I'm announcing today that we're pushing back the reopening of non-essential businesses in the Montreal region to May 18. The Legault government has been under pressure amid concerns transmission rates in Montreal remain high. Quebec accounts for more than half of Canada's 60,000 cases. While many stores outside the greater Montreal area, companies are allowed to reopen though they must follow strict guidelines from public health. Not all were busy, but as Simon Nakaneshny found out, they are just happy to be back in business. If there was a place to be in St. Jérôme as retailers opened their doors again, this fabric shop was it. A lineup snaked through the parking lot for most of the day. To make masks to, uh, for my daughter's a nurse at, at St. Justine, so I her and her colleagues and all my friends and family and a lot of people need masks. Other non-COVID related businesses are also ringing up sales, but only a few at a time. Je sens les gens anxieux un peu euh, et euh, ils respectent. Euh, tu veux que je fasse ceci, je vais faire ceci. Alors c est, c est, ils, sont, ils sont dociles. At L'Avantage, when a customer tries on a dress or top, it gets steam cleaned and taken off the floor for a week. No one even makes it through the front door without a mask. Still, for both staff and customers, just being open again felt like a win. Oh, it's a therapy to come here. <laughs> and he came in and said, oh, we're so... Ça va bien aller. Ça va bien aller. Yeah. But the decision to reopen wasn't being taken lightly. Bijou Saint-Georges has been in operation for 42 years. I couldn't sleep yesterday night well because, uh, like, imagining, uh, you know, to open uh, was... People, the, the, the way they go, they, they're going to react and everything. But thank God, I mean, people, uh, you know, like I said, we've been here for 40 years, so people, they're used to it. It's hardly business as usual here in St. Jérôme, but seeing the lights on and open signs in the shop windows is a kind of return to normalcy, a new normal that's very different from the way things were. Simon Akineshny, CBC News, St. Jérôme. Well, not surprised about the fabric store. I know fabric is very hard to come by even online, yeah. so. Yeah, and it, you know, it's understandable that the businesses and customers for that matter are kind of are kind of nervous. They're just, uh, sure. you know, wanting to go at it slowly, at least for the time being. Yeah, I'm not sure I would be jumping yeah, in there as back in. as possible. <laughs> All right, stick with us. We are answering your questions with Dr. Murthy next.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We do not yet know what's going to happen, but we know that we have some room to increase our social connections, to increase our work, to increase our school and daycare and childcare. Dr. Bonnie Henry says BC is beginning to reach that point where regular interactions between people will eventually be able to double. She revealed new modeling today that shows how the province can do that while still containing the COVID-19 virus. Absolute tragedy, our you know, heart goes out to them and just, you know, yeah, everybody who has kids understands it's just terrible. A nine-year-old girl and a 10-year-old boy have been identified as the two children who died after their family's off-road vehicle crashed into a lake near Chilliwack. The kids were from Abbotsford and the family had been driving the UTV at Foley Lake. The vehicle lurched off the road, rolled down a steep embankment and plunged into the water. Two adults and a child escaped. There have been uh, significant uh, uh, annual casualties as a result of this, uh, of this defensive behavior of these hornets. There's plenty of buzz that the so-called Asian murder hornet is becoming a bigger problem in BC. The theory is they've arrived here on board cargo ships from Asia. They're being asked to report any sightings, but they often nest underground in dense forests. Well, the pandemic has forced many of us to shift our life and work online. Now that's expanding to health care. This weekend, the Prime Minister announced a nearly quarter billion dollar investment. So more Canadians can access doctors over the Internet. Health reporter Vicka Dopia shows us what that change could look like. There are no patients waiting at this children's hospital. They're seeing doctors online, even for non-life-threatening, urgent cases. Um, we received a request to have a virtual visit with one of our pediatric physicians here. Now that all provinces and territories have agreed to pay for phone and video doctor's visits, virtual care has taken off. And put your finger um, and it will help us monitor your oxygen levels. For some patients, online visits are even preferable. If anything, there's just greater benefits with having less stress. Again, you know, breaking down those barriers of driving, parking, frequency of appointments. Canada was considered a pioneer in telemedicine. Doctors ...to prescribe help for patients who would otherwise be isolated. But the uptake in our public health care system had been slow, usually limited to rural and remote medicine, so private virtual health apps have thrived. What if you could be talking to a doctor in two minutes or less from the comfort of your home? Now it's not just hospitals temporarily offering virtual care, but family doctors too. The healthcare system had stalled for a really long time, and we've just seen a massive explosion during the time of this pandemic. In a recent report, Canada's doctors called on Ottawa to make virtual care a priority and set national goals and standards instead of relying on a patchwork of programs and pilot projects. But when it's safe to go back to the office, doctors and patients may not be ready. This pandemic can be a catalyst for better care in Canada. Uh, by implementing more virtual care because it has really shown us that the desire is there, the need's there, and we can do it. Like so much of this outbreak, interim measures could be the new normal. Vicodopia, CBC News, Toronto. Okay, it's that time in the show where we take your questions and put them to the experts. Call us at 604-662-6801, send an email, or put your question in our live chat on Facebook or YouTube. Dr. Murthy is back with us tonight. Dr. Murthy, thanks for joining us. Hello, Anita. Good evening. Bonnie Henry talked about the doubling of social interactions today from 30 to 60 percent. What doesn't seem clear is what that actually looks like. So what does that look like to you? Yeah, so if you think of 100% is where we were back in January, restaurants, bars, movie theaters, um, think of 30% as to where we are right now. Um, and so basically midway between those two. So that could look like schools that are reopened, at least in a phased way. That could look like daycares being open, other childcare options being available, and then maybe some other workplaces scaling up as well. And I think each city and each place in the province may take their own interpretation of that. But I think it's just gonna be a very careful and phased approach as to how we reopen. 
Well, and you're talking about different cities using different approaches, but what about different provinces? So BC's yeah. methodology seems to be different than other provinces when it comes to reopening. Those provinces yeah. that have much higher rates of infection are opening sooner than us. What do you make of that? Yeah, I, uh, I'm proud to live in British Columbia, I think, right now. I, I, I see what's happening in other provinces, and in some ways they may be a bit premature at opening things up, but we do understand why they have that motivation. Um, if community spread is reasonably limited and all of the spread is in institutions and other places where they think they have control, then conceivably opening things up in the community may not be that impactful. Um, on the contrary, um, if there's still large-scale community spread, opening up is going to be a problem. Kay Kavanaugh wants to know from YouTube, could your blood type help with resistance to the virus? Uh, we don't think so. Um, yeah, I, clearly, we don't know all of the factors related to how people get infected and who gets infected more severely than others. Um, there's no sign right now that blood type is one of those major determinants, but it could be a space for further research. Not sure why, but we've had a few blood-related questions today. Pete on Facebook asks, is COVID-19 a disease of the blood vessels, hence the damage to multiple organs, not just the lungs? You know what? That's an excellent question. And the more we learn about COVID-19, the more we think that it's not just a, um, a cough and cold virus that causes lung problems, but causes all sorts of different organ problems. And we're learning that there may be blood vessel disease, and that's why we'll see some kidney failure and some heart problems and some liver problems in patients with COVID-19. And so the blood vessels seem to be a, a major target for maybe a therapeutic um, that might end up working. We have a question from Anil. He's asking, how are doctors and nurses staying safe if they have to be so close to patients who have COVID, especially since we hear that, you know, masks aren't that effective? Sure. And so like most doctors and nurses, when they're seeing patients, will protect themselves by wearing appropriate clothes like scrubs and face masks and things like that. There's lots and lots and lots of hand washing, lots of changing of clothes after uh, or before they leave the hospital so that they don't possibly infect their community and their households. Um, and people end up taking a lot of care. But remember that like, if virus for some chance ends up on someone's shoes, the likelihood of that virus getting into someone else's mouth and nose is pretty negligible unless someone else were to say, lick that person's shoes. Um, and so even if there is a off chance of virus landing on someone's shoes and then leaving the hospital, it's unlikely that's going to cause further community spread. Well, hopefully no one is licking anyone's shoes. Hopefully we've learned that much so far. Yeah, okay. Um, what stood out to you today in Dr. Henry's modeling? I think looking at the science and looking at what we can do going forward, and if we double our rates of human interactions and social connections over the coming months, you see that it's a reasonably flat line. And obviously all models are um, possibly imperfect, um, but this seems to be the best data that we have available to us now. What stood out to me is that the difference between 60% and 80% reopening um, may not seem like much to us, but if you look at the shape of those curves, um, there's a sizable difference in the numbers of cases. Um, and so while doubling what we are currently doing seems like a lot, um, we still have to be very, very careful at how that is navigated going forward. Um, our public health teams are going to be all over every single patient who has um, a possible case to make sure that they can trace and isolate the affected individuals. Because I think that's the most important thing right now is aggressive public health tracking. Horkis Chang by email is asking, um, he's talking about the pyramid that Dr. Bonnery Henry showed, and it illustrates that PPE is the least effective. He wants to know why it's not effective, and is it because people are not handling PPE properly? Like we shouldn't rely on the PPE itself to protect us. A lot of the protection that we get is just through behavior, um, knowing what causes the infection and how it's transmitted, say things like rubbing your nose after you shake hands, things like exposing yourself to an infected individual and taking a deep breath in while they cough. All of those things are going to be far more problematic than just relying on a mask. I'm not saying masks are unimportant. They're obviously part of the pyramid of protecting ourselves. Um, but the behavior that's required to protect yourself and knowing which PPE is important and when is the main message that really needs to get out there. 
Ian Robbins is asking by email, um, talking about the meat packing plant in High River, River, Alberta, but you can also look at the poultry plants infected here in, in BC. Yeah. If meat was handled by someone who had COVID-19, could it infect me when I buy it from the store? To be truthful, unlikely. By the time it gets from the meat packing plant packaged in a truck all the way to a store and then you purchasing it, um, it's unlikely that that will cause you any problems. Hopefully you also cook it um, before you, you ingest it. The big problem with the meatpacking plant infections is the people who work at the meatpacking plants um, and our inability to protect them adequately from further ongoing spread at their workplace. Janice Mallison emailed in. She says, I, I'd like to understand how we're planning to use testing and contact tracing to help control virus spread and help reduce the amount of social isolation that we're all feeling. Sure. Um, and so you can envision a way that if you have symptoms, you get tested as soon as possible. Um, and if you're positive, you get isolated. And then tracing is people around you are contacted and they get isolated. And as soon as they develop symptoms, they get tested. If they don't develop symptoms, they're allowed to be free after a period of time. Um, and with that, um, where you create rings of areas where you're protecting against further spread in as quickly a fashion as possible, you can prevent this from propagating. And this is a tried and true method of solving public health crises within the setting of an outbreak. Um, and it does work. It just has to be done very aggressively. And so that as soon as someone is tested positive, every one of their contacts should be contacted within a short period of time to make sure that they're appropriately isolated and counseled. Dr. Murthy, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much again for being on the show tonight. No problem. Have a good night, Anita. You too. 647, a live look from downtown Vancouver tonight. The sun's still poking through there. We had a mix of sun and cloud to start the work week on the south coast. And Brett says it's warming up. His forecast is next.
Our lives are rapidly changing. When the news affects you most, we're still here. Stay calm, stay informed. We're all in this together. I'm clapping for all of us. There's so many essential workers. I want them to be seen. Turn on your radio and join us as we bring you a little companionship, community, and connection. Weekday mornings, beginning at 5 a.m. Time to check in with meteorologist Brett Soderholm again for the full forecast. Brett, I'm looking outside. It's looking pretty lovely. I'm confused, though, because if I look at my forecast on my phone, it just shows rain all the time. But every day I'm feeling good. It's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> don't trust the phone. Well, it's good that you're in good spirits no matter what. I'm definitely noticing, yeah, that the weather has just been really all over the place recently and uh, definitely wanted to be passing along that. As far as this week is concerned, we're only going to be getting a little bit of rain and then by the end of this week, honestly, it is going to be feeling very summer-like indeed. Let's start straight to it. I want to show you what it's looking like in terms of our precipitation forecast across the region for the next 24 hours. And if we start by zooming out from the south coast, you're going to see that as we go out, we're going to be looking at a little bit of showers throughout the overnight period but widespread across BC tomorrow there's really not a lot going on it's going to be fairly quiet whether you're in Vancouver Kamloops or even up toward Prince George and uh, as we zoom in there is going to be a few spotty showers here and there in terms of at uh, higher elevations but for most people it is going to be a really dry day and I do want to mention farther to the north we're still looking at very stable conditions here which is of course good for these regions that have, of course been impacted by the floods today was an interesting day as a shout out to Fort Nelson it was snowing actually, for the better part of the morning. And by midweek, we're going to be getting closer to about 18 degrees in terms of temperatures there. Into the south as well, temperatures for the Okanagan and parts of Metro Vancouver are going to be well above seasonal for Tuesday. But watch what happens comes Wednesday. We're going to be going down a few degrees and going a little bit closer towards seasonal. Now, the reason for this, pretty straightforward. We have some showers that are going to be making their way across the province on Wednesday. But in behind that, there's something we haven't seen for a while. It's going to be a dominant area of high pressure. Once once again, this is going to correspond with lots of sunshine and especially come Friday when this high pressure is on the eastern side of Vancouver, that's going to be bringing in a lot of warmth up from the states and we are going to be feeling this essentially no matter where you are into the lower mainland. Take a look at this five day forecast. If you've just been sick and tired of seeing these showers, all of the cloud cover will looking ahead toward the late week. Remember, these are temperatures at YVR essentially down close to the water. We're going to see temperatures throughout Thursday and Friday reach 20 degree degrees there rather. If if you are farther inland, though, places like Burnaby or Coquitlam or even toward the Fraser Valley, guaranteed these are going to be closer to temperatures into the mid-20s. So it's going to be feeling much like summer. And I've got pretty good confidence that this is going to stay this way the entire weekend. Wow, that's fantastic. Nice and toasty. Well, not toasty, but, you know, nice, nice and comfortably <laughs> kind of. warm. It's toasty enough. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. <laughs> Well, he's 101 years old and still going strong. How this veteran is raising money for charity. Next.
Okay, a World War II veteran is finding ways to serve his adopted country. 101-year-old John Hillman is using his age as a marker as he started walking laps all in the name of charity. Oh, I feel good. I feel fit. I've practiced going around several times. Hillman was inspired by a fellow Second World War veteran, Captain Tom Moore of England, who walked 100 laps around his own garden, also raising money for charity. Hillman has been a Canadian for 20-odd years and now lives in Oak Bay at a retirement home. He began his first five laps today with cheers from his family and friends, and he used his walker for support making his rounds. He hopes to raise $101,000 for Save the Children Canada. Uh, watched the news of the uh, children fund and uh, I, I, I get very emotional about some of the circumstances of those children. Okay, Hillman is planning to walk five laps a day, rain or shine. He hopes to complete his 101 lap goal in 20 days. Wow. Keep on walking, John. That's I hope I can awesome. walk like that at that no age. Kidding. That's 101. Amazing. Well done. Okay, it's May the 4th. Yes, it is. And in honor of May the 4th, Mike is wearing his special tie. Can we get a little close up? Oh, maybe? yeah, sure. It's, uh, I can only wear this one day a year. Let's just make sure we get it. Let's just tell them if they can't see it. Little Yodas. Yeah, there. Can you see there? There. Whoops. Oh, yeah. Oh, a good time. Be a Jedi <laughs> May the fourth be with you. May the fourth be with you. She Star stole Wars, my yes. line. Did I? <laughs> well, you can say it too. Everybody's saying it oh, <laughs> pretty much throughout the day. And in honor, of course, of May the fourth, we are leaving you with the VSO's physically distancing, uh, distant rendition of the Cantina Band song from Star Wars. You can say it. All right. May the fourth be with you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.